Gorbidal once said everyone is bisexual. In the 90s, bisexuality has been moving steadily towards the mainstream in film, in print, and media. But greater exposure has also bred greater misconception and misunderstanding. Harvard professor Marjorie Garber's Vice Versa examines the phenomenon of bisexuality and challenges its definition, and we're pleased to have her here on this broadcast. Welcome. Thank you. Let's get to the... T why is it all of a sudden the hot topic? I point to... Newsweek, which I have here somewhere with a cover from Newsweek, and it's on the bisexuality. Um, what's going on in the media today in terms of film, as I mentioned, in terms of magazine cover stories, so that everybody is sort of focused on bisexuality? It's all over the place. This isn't, of course, the first time in this century that bisexuality has been chic. Yeah. It was chic in the 70s, it was chic in the 40s, it was chic in the 30s and the teens and so forth. But it's extraordinary, uh, bisexuality in the 1990s, that it is in every magazine, in every newspaper. Is it different now? I think it is a little bit different. I think that gay liberation has made an enormous difference to how people understand the possibilities of mm. sexual lifestyles and sexual choices and sexual destinies. And I think that the bisexuality of the 90s is in part indebted to the possibility that young people are seeing of defining themselves in new ways. In fact, a lot of young people I've talked to recently have chosen the word bisexual as the word that describes their own erotic feelings least poorly. And they said In to me, words, nothing else fits. So this, nothing else fits. This they doesn't, don't want to this doesn't really themselves. fit, but, but it's. They think it, it may fit. It comes closer than the other things which don't. They think it may fit. They're leaving their options open. Well, there are only three options like heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual. That, well, we could look at it that way. We could yeah. say their little kind of uh, check form that you get from the government that says, we yeah, these right, little boxes right. But would you checked. disagree with that? I wouldn't disagree with it, but I think that that's the beginning of a conversation rather than the end of okay, it. Okay, I agree. So this is the beginning of our conversation. What is it? Well, uh, one way of describing bisexuality Other is than the least erotic, objective definition. It's erotic attraction to men and to women. Uh, it could be what's called concurrently, that is, at the same time in your life. It could be sequentially. First you're attracted to men, then you're attracted to women, or the other way around. Uh, or it could be the third term that's often used situationally. That is, you're in a same-sex situation or an opposite-sex situation, mm -hmm. and you're feeling sexy, and so you feel sexy toward the people that you're with. Uh, what I think is really more the case is that bisexuality is the ground of human sexuality. Uh, that what we might call erotic specializations or erotic exclusivities, like monosexualities, mm -hmm. like exclusively heterosexual, exclusively homosexual, are versions of human sexuality, as is bisexuality, which is attraction to both men and women. Now, there's a lot of, there is a lot of literature coming out now, scientific literature or in medical in, in, uh, studies that are suggesting, and I'm not an expert on this in a sense, but uh, that is suggesting that homosexuality is genetic determined. Do you buy that? If so, what's bisexuality in that definition? I actually talk about that in my book. I go and I read Simon LeVay's right. protocols right. on the uh, so-called gay gland and the gay gene that Dean Hamer talks about. Right. Uh, and what's interesting is that in order to come out with a judgment as to whether a gland or a gene is gay or straight, they have to throw out the middle category. They have to recode their bisexual subject as either purely homosexual or pu purely heterosexual. So in fact, the, the, the experiment produces the answer that it's designed to produce by, by creating what Hamer calls a dimorphic sample, either or sample. Yeah. Nothing in the middle can possibly exist. And so it writes out bisexuality, which is a very common scientific development. In fact, there was a piece, I think, in a Newsweek in the middle of the summer about the uh, uh, the homosexual gene in fruit flies. They now have begun to experiment with fruit flies, and they've produced homosexuality in fruit flies. And you read through this article in about paragraph 10 or paragraph 20, they say, well, actually, it's not so much that the fruit flies are homosexual. In fact, they're also attracted to female flies as well as to male flies, so that, strictly speaking, they should be called bisexual rather than homosexual. Well, I'd say it's more than strictly speaking. What's the difference in sexuality and bisexuality? Well, I'd claim, in fact, that there is no difference. Sexuality yeah. is uh, a whole sequence of feelings that we have, uh, desire, attraction, crushes, actual sexual experiences with people, relationships, one-night stands, the whole realm of uh, sexual feelings that we may have toward other people, uh, toward the responses that we have toward music, toward uh, 
uh, film stars, I mean, a whole set of feelings that people develop that are triggered by, erotic feelings that are triggered by responses in our culture. In fact, I think we live in a bisexual culture. Uh, if you look at almost any magazine today, if you open to an advertisement... It is. It's amazing to me. You're absolutely... And why is that? Is it because it, it's erotic to a readership? Is it because they have found out that somehow it's... What? Well, I think, you know, Woody Allen's old joke about bisexuality, at least you've got a 50% better uh, chance of a date on Saturday yeah, night, right, works right. for advertising, too. Obviously, yeah. they want all customers to be interested in their underwear, yeah. not just half the customers. What's the fantasy element about bisexuality? I think there are two, actually. I think that, that people fantasize about uh, partners that they don't have. Yeah. Uh, and I think that they also fantasize that everybody in the world could be an erotic partner. Uh, this is a lot how celebrity works, that, that uh, uh, celebrities fall, make people fall in love with them. The whole business about star power is to have everybody in the world adore you, fall in love with you, admire you. Uh, and in a way, the fantasy aspect of bisexuality is the aspect of being universally loved, of being yeah. universally desired. Uh, the flip side of that, and that, that scares so many people, is the fear that everybody out in the world could be an erotic rival. If everybody could be an erotic partner for your partner, yeah. then everybody's your erotic rival. Nobody is safe. You send your boyfriend or your husband off to the golf club, uh, and you think he's safe till that evening cocktail party when he might flirt with women, but what's he doing at the, co at, at the golf course? The idea is that somehow there's no space that is not eroticized. Yeah. What, what do you do at Harvard? I teach English literature. I teach Shakespeare. I teach <laughs> Renaissance drama. I teach modern culture. Why do you write books about sexuality and cross-dressing? And, and now vice versa. Well, the, first of all, they're fascinating subjects. Yeah. They're subjects that have some relationship to Shakespeare. I got into them actually one way through Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote the sonnets, one of the most famous sets of bisexual love poems in our time. Uh, many of the plays of Shakespeare function around erotic triangles in which there are two men and a woman, or two women and a man. Like? Like Othello is a very good example, yeah. uh, where what Iago desperately wants is to be the person most dear to Othello. I don't suggest necessarily that he wants to have erotic sexuality with Othello, although it is Iago who has or manufactures an erotic dream. Uh, but the, the rivalry that he feels with Desdemona is a rivalry for uh, Othello's love, for Othello's preference. There is bi bisexuality a passing phase in people's lives, or is it a lifelong? It's an interesting question because we tell our sexual biographies backwards from where we are. Uh, very often, uh, if people try to account for who they are erotically, who they are sexually, they begin with who they are right now. Right. I'm in a relationship with so-and-so, and here are the reasons and, the, and the, the byways that have led me to this place. And so they connect the dots backward, adding up to the perfect person who is me right now. Uh, but those dots occur between other dots. A lot, lot of people write out moments in their lives that don't seem to make sense in terms of the erotic person that they are right now. And those moments that they write out may well be moments of same sex or for gay or lesbian people, opposite sex relationships uh, that, that somehow they want to excuse or uh, forget or that they do forget. This business of a phase, that, that word comes up so much yeah. in the discussion of bisexuality. It's a phase. I was going through a phase. It happened when I was in school. Or, when, or I was drunk. Or, or I, was, yeah, I, right, I, right. I, I didn't mean it. I was experimenting. I didn't know myself as I know myself now. We were together in the dormitory, whatever. That, that, that claim that somehow an erotic experience or even an erotic feeling, a deep crush, doesn't count, is one of those things that I want to argue against. It seems to me that we learn to love by loving, that we become the people that we are, through the sum total of uh, erotic experiences that we have and erotic feelings that we have, because I want to emphasize that I'm not only talking about practice, I'm talking about feelings. I'm right. talking about strong, affectional relationships, uh, whether or not they're one-sided or reciprocated. Is it, by virtue of what we said in the beginning about how much more it's on the cover of magazines, you've written a whole book about it, is it becoming more accepted in American life? In some places, yes. I think but is it only in cities and urban areas and only in sort of 
places like New York and San Francisco and... Not at all. There are bisexual organizations certainly around the country. There are over a thousand bisexual organizations for people who identify as bisexual persons. Now, I like to use the word bisexual as an adjective rather than a noun. A bisexual person. Uh, well, to, to talk about bisexual, about people living bisexual lives, living long bisexual lives and having moments in their lives that may be homosexual and moments in their lives that may be heterosexual. Uh, looked at in that way, it seems to me that there are a lot of people who would fit this kind of definition of bisexual or living bisexually, yeah. although they would never apply that label to themselves. Yeah, I mean, I, when, when you see someone who was formerly a homosexual in their own judgment, in, mm -hmm. in terms of what, on the surface, and now a, a, are obviously a heterosexual, living certain parts of a heterosexual lifestyle, what do you assume? That they've simply changed, or it's for cover, or it depends on the facts? I don't assume anything. Right. What I, do you I, I ask them, or I, I, yeah. I try and to find out. And what do you out. find out in most cases? Well, I find out the, uh, different things from different people. Sometimes people will say, well, I was well, this, I mean, and now I'm that. There are a lot of gays that, have, that live in a, in, a, in a heterosexual marriage, for example, and people say... Well, they say it's a lavender cover. marriage, they say right. it's a cover, they right. say it's a beard, exactly. They say it's an excuse. Many people who live in that kind of relationship, like Cole Porter, for right. example, right. Uh, live in it for a very long time. The marriage means something to them. John Cheever is another person we could talk about in this context, who clearly descri described himself as heterosexual, had a long marriage, uh, uh, children, children right. uh, wrote about this in his diaries a lot, didn't like the term heterosexual for himself at all, but wrote passionately about his erotic relationships with men. He didn't like the word homosexual. It connoted things to him that he was scared of and that he didn't identify with himself. Uh, his son describes him as bisexual. Interesting that there's so much talk now about bisexuality at a time that is also talk, you know, in the politics of the country of conservatism, family values, traditional marriages, and all that. Well, I think it's part and parcel of the same thing. I think one thing what's happening in the country is that we're beginning to worry a little bit about labels and categories about the, the, the question of whether people can be summed up by a, an identity that is a name or a word. Let me go find as I end this segment. Uh, tell me about the three pairs. The three pairs, uh, this is a painting by a painter called Janet Griffiths. Right. Uh, I asked the question at the end of the book, what is a pair? And I look at the different ways in which these three pairs can be paired. Hmm. It was important to me that the cover of the book should not have a picture of a person or a set of people but rather that it should suggest a set of relationships, a set of patterns, that bisexuality is in a way a structure in human life and not just the description of a man and a woman, a famous one or an unfamous one. These three pairs, it seems to me, suggest the possibility of bisexuality uh, as the beginning rather than as the ending of a discussion of a new way of looking at human sexuality as a mode of human freedom. I thank you for coming on the program. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, this book is much talked about. We didn't get a chance to talk about it. You wrote a piece that was in the New York Times op-ed on, it was July 22nd, this past weekend, about all the movers and shakers at the Bohemian Grove, which a group of, of powerful men come together and sit by the campfire, and I guess... And they, apparently they cross-dress, and they, cross and they and, uh, whatever do all they other do. kinds of things. They, uh, uh, it's, what's interesting about this, of course, is that um, if this behavior took place among a group of gay men, uh, they would presumably think of it as countercultural rather than the, as, as the yeah. essence of These are the culture. most powerful men in America. Presumably so. Yes. Vice Versa, Bisexuality and the Eroticism of Everyday Life by Marjorie Garber, Professor of English That's Literature it. at Harvard University. Thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night.